The first speaker needs very little introduction. It's Kevin Conrad. He's the executive director of the Coalition for Rainforest Nations. I think all of you here know him very well. He's also a special envoy and ambassador to the government of PNG on climate change issues. And Kevin will open this morning with a presentation on a concerted international approach for transparent and accurate MRV. Kevin, the floor is yours. Button push. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, just a few uh, capacity building exercises here with regard to technology. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rome. Uh, welcome also uh, to this uh, red greenhouse gas inventory, really presentation, status update, and brainstorming session as to what we need to do together to ensure that RED is an active contributor to the problems that we're going to face more and more in the future related to climate change. So I want to give a little bit of context for that. I think all of you have heard this many times, that in the next five to 10 years, We've got gigaton after gigaton after gigaton of emission reductions that are necessary from business as usual if we even have a prayer of keeping things under 450 parts per million uh, and trying to keep temperature change under two degrees. Now, with that challenge comes both opportunities and threats, obviously. Now, as you look at the data, a significant amount of the possible emission reductions can come from developing countries. However, those developing countries, including Papua New Guinea, have some of the most challenging capacity building work ahead of them if we are going to be able to contribute with those emission reductions. So about 70% of the possible emission reductions as we look forward are possible from developing countries. Now here's something else that's very interesting. Of the 14 gigatons possible in developing countries, about nine gigatons of that total comes from forests and land. So if we consider what is necessary for the world to stay on a 450 parts per million pathway. Forests and land are the most significant sector we have in front of us, which is why we're here today. And it's a challenge to each of you here today that we hold the future of the climate of the world in our hands, and it's up to us together to build the capacity and set up the systems to help the country, the, sorry, the country, the world stabilize. So what does that mean? One of the best ways to accomplish that is to start measuring, reporting, and verifying greenhouse gas emissions. There's a famous saying by Peter Drucker that says, we cannot manage what we don't measure. How do we manage emission reductions in red if we're not measuring them? And as we'll see further in the presentation, very few red countries, even though this is one of the most significant levers that we can pull to try to keep the climate on track, many developing countries cannot yet measure accurately their emissions. And we've got to disaggregate the activity. We've got to track the timelines 
when, is this, when has this happened in the past? What is it that we're doing today? And how can we predict what we can achieve in the future? We've got to make sure that this is done in a transparent way, that we can share it with the rest of the world, and with the, when the rest of the world looks at our data, they have confidence that we are reporting accurately. So it's about technical capacity, institutions. We've got to build the institutions in our countries. And we've got to actively engage all of civil society, the public sector, the private sector. All actors have to be engaged in both the emission reductions, but also the measuring, the reporting, and the verification of those emission reductions. Now, I, I show this slide as it is, these are the countries that are presently involved in the CD Red project. Now, I have to move very quickly to this slide because this shows all of the countries that are in the CFRN, and there are many other countries also that need uh, this active engagement. So let me just go back again. This is where we are currently working. This is where we'd like to be working. There's a lot of work to be done. We need to scale up the finance. We need to scale up our teams. We need to scale up the collaboration. If we are going to have any chance of getting emissions from red measured, reported, and verified in, in sufficient time to make an active contribution to the climate change challenge that we all face. So all the responsibility falls on the team. And here they are. And I put up this uh, picture simply so that you know who's who. Um, and as you see people wandering around, you can, uh, you can sort of match a face with a person. So I'll stop there. And I'd like to thank again Mete for agreeing to uh, facilitate with me. We're, we're sort of doing, she's doing the morning, I do the afternoon. Uh, we'll reverse the roles tomorrow. The idea is that you don't get tired of our voices, so you only have a couple hours of us. Um, I want to thank all of the countries for coming here. Thank all of the donors who have been contributing to this effort. Thank all of the agencies and partners for their excellent work in collaborating with us to at least start on this very important journey. Thank you very much and good morning. I'd like to invite Daniela Göhler to come to the podium. Daniela as is working as an advisor of the German International Cooperation Agency, uh, seconded to German's Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety, very long, also known as BMU. Uh, she works in the Division on International Climate Finance and International Climate Initiative on Forest, Red and Adaptation Issues. Prior to this assignment, uh, Daniela spent several years in Indonesia and in, uh, with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and a year in Cameroon on national forest programs. She's also worked for FAO and the World Bank. She has a degree in forestry and is currently taking a PhD in international politics. Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mette, and <clears throat> welcome again, everyone. First of all, my apologies that Horst, or best regards from Horst Freiberg, who heads our Red Plus Division, who cannot be here today because he broke his ankle. So he was very sad he couldn't come to this meeting in particular, and he texted me last night to make sure I don't forget to say hello on his behalf to you. Second of all, sorry for my sore voice. I've caught a cold, not here in Rome, but it was minus 14 degree in Berlin on the weekend, so I was prepared, but it still hit me. So now, um, I was asked to um, present um, a bit more general framework of the International Climate Initiative, uh, which is funded by the Ministry of Environment, and how we um, intend to drive strategic investments to protect forests. So just, um, you may have seen this slide many times, but uh, how this, our finance mechanisms works is that um, 
<clears throat> Initially, it was set up as an innovative new finance mechanism that was financed through the auctioning of emission uh, allowances. But as you can imagine, that would have got us into trouble with the carbon price being very, very low. So now um, the funds for our climate finance uh, are provided from the federal budget and this is more or less it is more than uh, 120 million euros per year this is the secured funding but um, with an additional fund the German government has set up for climate and energy measures um, it is um, more now um, normally we um, uh, issue a call for proposals every year to uh, um, <clears throat> support um, um, innovative solutions and to trigger sort of new ideas to help solving um, climate change related problems. Um, the main feature of this ICI, of this International Climate Initiative, is that we want to contribute uh, more or less directly to advancing the negotiation processes on mainly the UNFCCC but also the uh, Biodiversity Convention. So this is the uh, I would say, most um, important criteria and a salient feature that this um, ICI is specifically, uh, has specifically a, a climate lens. Um, we do support projects in developing countries, emerging economies, and countries in transition in four main areas. Um, this is mitigation, which includes the whole energy efficiency, renewables agenda, uh, and uh, climate compatible development uh, plans. Red Plus is an own funding window for us uh, because we give uh, a lot of attention to the forest protection part. Adaptation is the third, and uh, finally, biodiversity. Um, just as an overview, um, Germany tries very hard to meet its climate finance targets, and so far, we have a growth pathway, as you can see, uh, from 2005 to 2012. And also in 2013, we managed to um, uh, achieve or over, uh, overachieve, actually, our committed finance targets and have this growth pathway. But um, to speak very frankly, it's a, it's a big challenge for us to keep that going or at least keep the current levels, which is our, which is our minimum um, um, goal, but um, as you know, also for the climate finance part, we have to struggle in our own governments to convince parliamentarians and other why um, we would want to to invest. Um, and this was Germany's overall climate finance, which is distributed between two ministries, my ministry, the Ministry of Environment, and the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. So the left... Um, graph is still um, the overall German climate funding um, and the, um, the share of the three main funding windows biodiversity is uh, integrated into the red window here. So um, to what uh, is at least 50% of the solution as Kevin just pointed out, um, we dedicate 30% of our funding to that at the moment. Um, and that uh, will not decrease, uh, as our minister said in Warsaw, at least we want to keep the red um, and forest um, funding at least at current levels. So we have the best intentions, but um, we will have to fight also internally. The biggest part is um, the remaining mitigation um, agenda and 26% for adaptation. Now, specifically the ICI, which is funded by the Ministry of Environment, the initiative started in 2008, and um, until today we have funded 80 projects um, with a funding volume of 208 million euros. So you can see it's not, um, this mechanism is not the big sums and very big programs, but we try to trigger innovative solutions, which sometimes can be smaller projects where we believe um, it's a lower impact input, but high effective output. This is what we focus on. Uh, we fund all uh, red plus phases, one, two, and three. Not so much in three yet, and with a clear focus on building institutions and capacities and uh, set up <clears throat> the required red plus um, mechanisms. It is important for us to be transparent about our finance agenda. Uh, we have a website um, which where all our finance is, the projects are listed. 
So we try to be a bit of a front runner. As you have noticed, perhaps it's quite difficult to get clear information about funders, uh, projects, who funds what, where and why. So we try to be a front runner here with our recently updated website and we also support Ted, <laughs> the interim Red Plus uh, partnership um, which is developing this voluntary Red Plus database. Um, now in the international context, uh, where is the ICI position there? Um, it is fair to say that Germany is one of the largest donors on forest protection and biodiversity. And in 2012 alone, we committed 413 million euros for forest protection and biodiversity. I think what our comparative strength is, as compared to others, is a clear um, history and um, broad experience on technical support and capacity development working in and being present in developing countries and understanding what their needs are and what the most appropriate means are to work with them and help them uh, you know, implementing reform process and building the necessary institutions, for instance, or setting up um, appropriate forest management mechanisms. This is what I think um, our strength is and where we also collaborate with other donors to be more effective. Um, we are actively involved in the negotiations in the EU team to help establishing the International Red Plus Mechanism or the issue lead is just here and we are proud that he is part of this project. This is also part of our strategy to get best available experts involved in our work. And um, at the last climate change conference in, in Warsaw, um, we are basically provided evidence for the serious commitment from our side by mobilizing also our minister to reconfirm and reinforce our, together with, the Norway, with Norway, the UK and the US, our Red Plus commitment, including also financial commitments. Um, as you may know, Norway, the UK and the US, they committed 280 million U US dollar for the biocarbon fund. Germany scaled up its um, early mover program. I'm just going to mention that later by 12 million euros. And the UK committed to provide funding for another country in the FCBF carbon fund. So what is a sort of a flagship of the German cooperation is this so-called red early mover program, which my ministry joined last year. So we contributed funding to that, and now it's a joint German program. It's, um, I think, the only bigger program uh, besides uh, the Norwegian initiatives to demonstrate how results-based finance uh, can work at the jurisdictional um, level. So now I thought um, the early mover term is actually quite nice to describe the role of this CD Red project for us. Because I believe when the project was set up in this one in 2009 and actually an earlier phase already in 2008, the rules, the rule book for Red Plus were not clear at all. But those who designed this program, they were in fact very clever. They knew what the basic instruments would be. And as Kevin was said, we can't manage what we cannot measure. So greenhouse gas inventories and measuring uh, forest data or providing uh, forest information would be needed for any kind of red plus mechanism. So I believe that this red project was really an, CD red project was really an early mover in terms of conceptual thinking and advancing something that was pretty new in the negotiation process. And now, so the first um, decision on red was in Bali in 2007, and then until Doha, the negotiations resulted in six decisions on red. And then in Warsaw, when the Red Plus rule book was completed, there were se seven uh, decisions on red in one conference, including on MRV. And during that period, the project, CD Red, um, progressed quite a lot under greenhouse gas inventories and um, now, of course, is flexible enough and is more or less already consistent with what the Warsaw rulebook says is needed. And this sets the standard and it's very impressive how a project, I think, can be so advanced and then still um, be compatible with what develops as um, the overall um, rulebook. So uh, this is my compliments to this project. I think we need these kind of forward-looking and strategic um, 
projects. And so now, in 2014, we have this conference, which presents clearly results and um, may be an early mover again for <laughs> whatever is going to come up, but I will come to that later. Um, <clears throat> Why did I say it's a strategic investment for us? And to be very honest, we do not have a completely strategic portfolio with so many projects. I mean, 80 projects uh, with 208 million euros that is sometimes a bit scattered all over the place. Um, and in the future, I think we do need more projects like CD Red. So while the path, not only the path to Warsaw, but uh, I think also the path of this project, um, may have had serpentines going sometimes back and forth and having to test things and maybe correcting also some things. Um, it was always and is of high relevance for the negotiations, but not only that, I said it's our main features, but the appealing thing is that it goes much beyond that and provides multiple benefits for our partner countries. So it does apply the UNFCCC principles very clearly, transparency um, and so on, and the IPCC guidelines. It does help to fulfill the just now defined reporting requirements. So when the first um, biannual update reports this year will be submitted, this project will have a, a main contribution already. It does help countries to set up um, and develop their, their own national approaches for measuring reporting and verification, which among other things is also a criteria to get access to the uh, promised or not yet promised uh, finance for results-based um, Red Plus. I think I have this point twice, so sorry for that. Um, and then beyond any UNFCCC uh, requirements or, or benefits, it helps country also in their own planning for a national mitigation plans and development and their, their own national to, to grow their own economy. So also there, you will, you will need land use sector information. Again, you can't manage what you cannot measure. And um, finally, we have so many countries represented here today. I believe there's a strong peer learning effect of that. It's, you know, no one else telling you what worked in a um, region that is not relevant to you, but it's among peer countries who have uh, similar problems and may learn from each other. Uh, almost last slide. Now, in addition to that, the CD Red project is also very well connected in our overall portfolio. This is just a sample of four projects who um, are closely related to, to CD Red. There could be more. Um, for instance, the National Forest Monitoring uh, Project with um, um, FAO, which uh, uses tools, technologies, uh, specifically on remote sensing and GIS developed by um, INPE. And we know that Brazil has uh, been quite successful in getting their deforestation rates down. So um, this project supports building capacities and using those, transferring knowledge to a number of other uh, countries. Um, then there's another project with FAO, which is a global uh, forest survey which collects forest inventory data again to improve uh, estimates of greenhouse gas um, emissions and removals which again will help then to uh, build national forest monitoring systems and fulfill the reporting requirements. So it all goes very well together and purposefully we have a similar or the same institutions involved to help fostering that. Uh, a country example, the Dominican Republic, who is here from Dominican Republic? Great. <laughs> uh, we have had um, um, also a very strategic project with the National Climate Change Council um, and the coalition involved to um, develop climate compatible development plans. And again, it all it goes around having a reliable and um, a trustful data and information. And last but not least, with the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, uh, we uh, built up a Red Plus Policy Assessment Center, which all goes around spatial planning um, and uh, an analysis of carbon and other um, benefits to support the multiple benefits of Red Plus. So well connected in our overall portfolio. And now if the road to Warsaw and to this conference was with a lot of serpentines, I hope, but it's up to you, and I look forward to, you know, listening to this conference. Perhaps the road now is a bit more clear and straightforward, 
and uh, potentially we had CD-RED 1, this is CD-RED 2, there may be something like CD-RED 3. Uh, the ministry is definitely interested in keep this going. We have extended this project to allow it for more time to um, also win other donors to, um, to um, follow up on this project, to provide further funding and continue this effort. I mean, we can't fund it forever, and it's in our interest to convince others how useful it is. And I think they will be convinced and um, continue this. Sorry if I was too long, um, and thank you very much for your attention. The last speaker this morning before our coffee break is from FAO. To welcome you here on behalf of FAO, we have Ms. Changjun Yao, who is the Director of Climate, Energy and Tenure Division within FAO. She came to FAO in, in 2011, and prior to that, she was a Director of the Institute of Environmental Protection at the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Engineering, and the Deputy Director General of the Department of International Cooperation at the Ministry of Agriculture in China. She is also a guest professor at the University of International Business and Economics. Ms. Xiao holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Agricultural Engineering and a Master's in Public Administration. Chang Jun, the floor is yours. Very long uh, introduction with my CWA. <laughs> Actually, I mean, uh, I was reluctant whether I should accept this invitation to give the presentation on behalf of FAO, because I'm not an, an expert on MRWA, and I'm not an expert on forestry, in forestry sector as well. But I'm very pleased to take this uh, I mean, opportunity to meet you all and also to share with you what IFO is working with on the capacity development in the climate change. Probably not only focus on the RAT plus program or relevant activities, but more broadly uh, also to cover some activities in the agricultural sector as well. So, yeah. Uh, so, so in my presentation, I will talk very briefly in three aspects. The first one is uh, the UNRAT uh, uh, activities. Because IFAO is one of the three UN agencies, as you all are aware, uh, to support the countries for the readiness of uh, the, the, the RAT+. Plus. So that's why IFAO has done quite a lot in this perspective. The second... Uh, 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 area I will cover is the MICA program. Uh, the MICA, in short, I mean, uh, is uh, uh, the relevant projects that uh, FAO does on the mitigation for agriculture. So the third uh, area I'm going to brief you is about the tools that we have on the climate change. So the first one is about the uh, UNRAD activity. Uh, for the UNRAD, as you know, FAO is responsible for MRWA, but in addition to that, we are re also responsible for the policy and also the governance. So uh, in, in the, uh, the last uh, couple of years, FAO worked on the policy governance, and particularly last year, we started to work on tenure issue as well. And for FAO, I mean, our role is to support the countries when the countries need the support from the agencies. And uh, I think FAO is very well recognized and also very well uh, acknowledged by the countries with our support. And also FAO emphasized our joint work with other two agencies, UNDP and UNEP as well. So, uh, for the three agencies, we do our best to act as one. I mean, in this uh, uh, principle of one UN. But when we provide our support to the countries, we have several key principles to follow. For example, 
uh, the ones that uh, I listed here. The first one is national ownership. Because we believe that only the countries have their own capacity to apply the practices that they recognize well, then they can act well, and then the, the whole global can benefit. And, and on, only when the countries own all this I mean, uh, knowledge and also the capacity, and they, then they can take the real action and the real achievements can be, can be made uh, with that. And also uh, for FAO, we provide some open uh, public uh, services like to provide some tools and information for the policy makings, for the, also for the scientific research as well. And also for us, the national capacity building is very critical. Uh, but uh, beyond that, we also have some, I mean, regional and also international activities because we believe that the nations, they, they have their own uh, knowledge, experience, and also successful stories. But those successful stories can be transferred to other countries only with this uh, knowledge sharing activities, like the regional workshops, the regional meetings as well. So, so I don't want to go through all these principles one by one, but uh, for FAO, I think the co country's ownership, the country's capacity is very uh, critical. And uh, you all know that uh, for the RAD, for the UNRAD, uh, we have been working with about uh, 48 countries. But actually, five years ago, uh, there were only nine countries that uh, we worked with. So, so this shows the, the very I mean, dramatic increase of the demand from the countries. And also the, the dramatic uh, uh, I mean, increase of the interest from the countries to get involved or to, to participate in this Red Plus and also the UN Red program as well. And uh, for the building capacity at uh, uh, the national level on the, on the sustainable forestry uh, monitoring, I think in, in the coming two days you will hear very special uh, knowledgeable presentation uh, from my colleague who works in the uh, forestry department and she uh, led a, a good team to work on the national uh, forestry monitoring activities and so that's why I don't want to go through very much in detail here. Only highlight that uh, FAO provides the direct support uh, to the countries in MRW. And uh, in addition to that, we also uh, have uh, regional activities. For example, in this year, in 2014, we will hold three uh, regional workshops, uh, respectively in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. So these three workshops will have the participants coming from more than 60 countries and uh, with a scale of more than 300 people. And uh, so, so for all this, I mean, uh, capacity development activities, we focus or aim to, to inform uh, uh, about the UNCCC information and also this in negotiation and also the requirements. And also to help the countries to improve their capacity to, to get involved more strategically, technically in the uh, negotiation and also to have more or stronger capacity to get ready for the Red Plus. And uh, for FAO, we also uh, work very closely with other organizations, including the FCPF, like uh, also the, the, the program that you are talking about, the CD-RED. And uh, for FAO, I think here I'm going to talk in a broader sense about uh, our capacity development activities in climate change in, in a broader sense. Uh, we have a, a, a website focuses on learning. 
And uh, you, you can, I mean, I do welcome you all to visit our website on uh, climate change learning. And we have the different uh, uh, modules there and to cover some case studies, some I mean, uh, meeting informations, and also uh, some e-learning courses. And uh, with all these e-learning courses, you can do self-learning, but you also can receive some uh, uh, bilateral uh, coaching uh, in, in the case that we provide that services. And uh, for FAO, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have, the MICA, we have a MICA program. And uh, we uh, developed a database on greenhouse gas emission for agriculture, forestry, and land use sector. And uh, last year, it's, it, it was uh, the first year that IFO included the green, 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 um, greenhouse gas emission data in our database. And also, it was the first time IFO launched the statistic yearbook with the data on, on uh, greenhouse gas emission from the agriculture and the forestry sector. And last year, we also hold uh, several regional conferences or the workshops uh, to uh, communicate with the region on our uh, database. So I think uh, time is running so far, and uh, I have to <laughs> end up my uh, presentation. Uh, quite soon, and uh, so, so I mean, in, in short or in conclusion, uh, we are very pleased to work with you all under the UNRWA program framework, but also in a larger broad of the areas uh, in the climate change for the agriculture sector as well. And uh, we look forward to, to having uh, more com uh, communication, more collaboration, and also uh, more chances uh, to, to, to work together with you in the coming days. And uh, I uh, wish you all have a very fruitful and informative uh, workshop in these two days. And also please enjoy the lovely uh, weather in Rome. Welcome you again. Thank you. Thank you for watching. For more information, see cdred.org.